Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Keep the Line Moving, the podcast designed to talk about leadership, life, and inspiration. I am your host, Chris Gargano, and for episode 70, we have a treat for you. But first, let me thank you for subscribing, recommending the podcast, filling out reviews. You know we appreciate it. Why is this episode special? Because we have three great leaders on, folks that I have worked with throughout my 21 years in professional sports. I know these people very well. They're great leaders. They're caring leaders. They're continuous learners. And they are going to share best practices within content in professional sports. It's a very interesting conversation and a perfect one for our 70th episode. The guests include Vittorio DiBartolo, Senior Director of Marketing for the Oakland Athletics, Rael Antin, Vice President of Content for the Washington Commanders, and Jessica Saccone, my former colleague at the New York Jets. She's the Vice President of Content Strategy and Marketing for the Jets. We talk about humility, accountability, servant leadership. The conversation starts now. We begin with Jess. Thanks for having me, Chris. This is a lot of fun um, to be here with Rael and Bet and uh, have this open dialogue and conversation today. Um, I think you uh, had said, let's start off with a little background. Um, so growing up in New York City, I was a big sports fan, played a lot of sports. I uh, was able to, you know, take the subway to the Bronx to watch the Yankees or the you know, garden to watch the Knicks. Um, but when I went to college, I didn't uh, envision necessarily the career in sports. Uh, but when I got an entry level opportunity with the Jets organization out of college, I jumped at the chance uh, to get into the NFL and I've never looked back. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to be able to grow uh, my career with the team over the past two decades. Um, so my day to day now includes uh, oversight of the team's digital and social verticals, um, which includes everything from our app to our website and all of our social platforms. Um, I also oversee the revenue um, opportunities as they relate to content across all our verticals um, and how we grow those uh, in partnership with our sales team. Uh, so in other words, looking at ways in which we can uh, engage current fans, uh, find new consumers of our content, and how do we monetize that and, and grow that um, across everything, broadcast, mobile, web, digital, social. Um, and then on top of that, I also oversee our influencer program for the team. Um, so I work to engage uh, different celebrities and influencers uh, throughout different touch points throughout the year uh, to, again, kind of increase that footprint and um, brand association with the Jets. Um, and in terms of leadership uh, specifics, I oversee a full-time team of seven people, um, but I also work uh, cross-functionally with a number of other uh, talented individuals who produce video and editorial for the organization. And together, we create that content that is hopefully engaging, entertaining, and monetizable. Um, so that's a little bit of the background. Uh, do you want to dive into leadership philosophy on that front still? Yes. Give us your leadership philosophy so we could embed it in our memories as we go through this conversation. Okay. Um, so my values and beliefs, you know, create a pretty simple framework for me to operate out of. Um, of course, there's other traits and tactics that come into play, but you know, my, my foundation is, is I try and keep that relatively simple so I can stick to it as, as much as possible. Um, first, it starts with me. Um, and I mean that in the most servant leadership way possible in terms of accountability. So personal accountability, am I doing something every day that is helping my people be the best employees and people they can be. Um, it's not going to be perfect, but if you're thinking about it every day, you're hopefully going to be successful in that endeavor. Um, and it's not just the best versions of, you know, the role they're coming here to do. How are the, who are they as a whole person and how am I helping them make sure that, you know, respect, humility, good teammates are all just important as the jobs that they're showing up to do. So I say to myself, you know, am I doing that too, right? Or every day it's a, it's that, am I showing up as the best version of myself? So that's that personal accountability piece. Um, and that allows you to require that team accountability. You know, I think that um, often in leadership, it's, uh, you know, you have to be willing to make the mistake and then be able to support the people who also make a misstep or a mistake. And how do you get people to be accountable and make sure that that's at the forefront of what you're thinking so that you can push the envelope so that you can excel 
um, because, you know, that leadership is never going to be perfection and neither is every piece of work product that we're, that we're putting out there every day. Um, I'd say the second piece is authenticity and that's really about perspective for me. Um, I think that obviously leadership is not about giving orders and making decisions, but it's actually understanding and appreciating the perspectives of the people that you're trying to lead. So for me, that's rooted in respecting others, right? Leader to employee and amongst employees themselves, and really having empathy and understanding about what their POV is and why that's their POV. Um, and I think that from there, you are not always going to agree. You're always not always going to have to come to the same decision or the same, um, you know, be aligned on everything. But you at least have said, I have been able to lead from looking at someone else's perspective. And then the last piece is adaptation and how do you continue to evolve, right? Um, yes, I'm going to have these core principles and different beliefs that I'm trying to lead with every day. But if you aren't tweaking and evolving and learning, um, your leadership approach is going to suffer as the world around you evolves. So those would be my kind of three guiding principles with lots of layers inside of them. No, the thank you for sharing. Just, just fantastic. Thank you, Jess. And obviously, we'll come back to Jess's leadership philosophy throughout the conversation. But Rayel, let's get to know you, my friend. That's a really tough act to follow, um, but I'll do my best. Um, I come from the Gargano coaching tree. Uh, and so we first crossed paths when I was pretty fresh out of college. I wanted to be, you know, print journalism beat reporter at the time, which I'm very glad I moved on from. Newspapers have, you know, a, a rougher time these days. And um, covering a baseball beat sounds like the the toughest job in sports now that I think about it. But anyway, cross paths with Chris when I, uh, he was at the San Francisco Giants and I had a game day small task of sending out a mass text program early on in the mass text days. This would have been 2009, 2010. And um, I think one thing I could say about Chris is, you know, a lot of people in his position at that time would not have taken time out of their schedule to meet with someone like me. I was not full-time. I had a very small role in his large operation. Um, but for whatever reason, he started with just giving me his time and his support and challenging me to tell him exactly what type of role I wanted to do. Um, and, you know, that led to me getting different roles that led me out of the print space and into the digital space, digital social sort of, sort of uh, blossomed at this time. And when Chris ended up at the Jets, he brought me on board as the director of digital social, you know, right around the time that the NFL was you know, the, the social space was just, there was so much opportunity there. And we're talking about broadcast contracts, limiting social highlight rights and, you know, early stages of those conversations. So it was a fascinating time. Uh, we, we produced some great content along with Jess, told some great stories. And uh, I learned a lot about leadership there. Uh, and since the jet stint, I spent some time at the XFL uh, well before the kickoff. Um, obviously the pandemic shut the XFL down and forced me to pivot. Um, and I eventually landed at the Washington Commanders, then the Washington football team in September, 2020. So I've just wrapped my uh, third season and uh, I'm the vice president of content here. I would say pretty similar scope to what Jess described. Um, digital social production, obviously monetization, very important. I think Jess nailed it when she said, what was it? Engaging, entertaining, and monetizable, right? If if we're checking all three of those boxes in everything we do, um, it's, it's great for all of us, right? And I don't even think you could say one's a priority over the other because obviously we're a business, making money is important, but if we're not serving the fan first, if that's not your cliche North Star, then then what are we really doing here? So uh, that's what I do at the Commanders, tell good stories and hopefully try and make money off of it in a tasteful way, right? I think that's another thing that we all probably focus on is like there's the lazy approach to monetization, which is slapping a logo bug in the corner. And then there's like, how can we tell a story that supports both of our brands, a football brand and a consumer product brand, for instance. Um, and let's see, as far as a leadership philosophy, um, you know, I have about 19 folks with various skill sets working on the content team. And I think one of the things I love about the content space is like a brainstorm is a true egalitarian system, right? I may be in the boss's chair, but there's probably someone 
fresh out of college who knows TikTok better than I do that's going to come up with the idea that's going to nail schedule release for us in May. And so I think the most important thing as a leader you can do is, you know, bring some humility to the table, which is like, as I get older and my role grows, which is great, I have a lot of decision-making ability. I also need to take a step back and realize I might not necessarily be the target audience anymore. And listening to people who understand that target audience more um, is an important part of our success. And so I think Jess said it best as far as, you know, we serve our reports I, my job is to get out of their way and set them up for success. You know, if we, if I need to ask my boss for a little more money so we can bring in the right freelance artist to take a schedule release concept from here to here, that's what I'm here for. Support them, listen to them when, when I hear about their pain points and also help them grow so that they can take my job eventually someday. I think we, we should all want that, that you are kind of, you know, fostering an environment where, if you were to leave, someone would step up and and the average commander's fan uh, wouldn't know the difference. Um, so yeah, that's that's the start of it. Excited to dive in more later. Nicely done, Rael. Nicely done. Not surprising. Vit, my friend, take it away. Wow. Uh, I get to go last, but those are both tough acts to follow. Um, I'm going to steal. I like that Gargano tree. I'm going to steal that for my next conversation. But um for me, uh, you know, I'm currently the senior director of marketing for the Oakland Athletics, going into my second season here in baseball. I currently oversee marketing, creative content, and ballpark entertainment. Um, prior to that, I spent two decades with the Silver and Black in the NFL with the Oakland and Las Vegas Raiders. I started my career as a, a show producer. You know, growing up, I wanted to be Chris Berman. I thought I'd be the next great ESPN anchor uh, when I found out the road to getting on air, uh, decided very quickly I did not want to move to Yuma, Arizona and um, make very little money. So I decided to kind of learn um, behind the scenes and start out at a TV station in Sacramento where I met the great Chris Gargano. Um, he gave me an opportunity at the Raiders that started out as a seasonal job and I made it my mission that first year to make it so they could not tell me to go home. Um, I spent my time at the Raiders, most recently being the vice president of social and digital media. Uh, really excited to be here and share my insights. For me, really, leadership comes down to learning from the people that mentored me. Um, so I'm going to try not to embarrass Chris too much, but he played a pivotal role in the leader I've become today. Um, leadership to me is something I constantly have to work at, um, whether that's reading, listening to podcasts, stealing things from other people. Um, I like to say I lead people and I manage projects. Uh, to me, you know, leading people is probably the most challenging and rewarding thing all at the same time. Um, you'll hear a lot of, you know, consistent words from me like empathy, trust, and positivity. I'm a big believer in body language, especially in our business. The losses can mount up, especially on the NFL side. I've been through two win seasons. Uh, you have to come in on Monday and you have to put on a smile and show your team that there's a job to be done and losses hurt. We all know that, but uh, we must move on from there. So I try to set an example every day and come in with a positive attitude. And that's definitely something I, I stole from Chris. So um, looking forward to talking through everything I've learned and hopefully I can share something that you can take away today and help you in your next adventure. That's awesome. So that's awesome. So let's look at this. The word serve or servant came up many times in all three of you, right? Even Vit closing it out by saying, we want to serve the audience today. So that it that doesn't change. There's a consistency in leadership that we are who we are, which means you wake up today and you go to the coffee shop or you drive to work or you say hello to this person or you go buy something at the store and then you walk into your business and you're all of a sudden a leader. No, it's what Vit said. It's consistency. And you all embody that, which means look at the commonalities in what you all just said. Humility came up. Serve, as we said. Accountability, respect, empathy, empowering, right? And we didn't pre-look at this or pre-plan this. Those were coming from your heart and soul. And then you communicated it here today. So with the foundation that we've created today, 
How do you give these tools? And Vic, you said something about being a continuous learner. We'll revisit that as well. So Jess, let's go back to you if we can, please. How do you come into the building every day, embody, be accountable to the values that you told us about earlier and share those philosophies so they could see it in you, leading by example, and then do it themselves in their own unique ways? You know, I think, Grail, that both made some really great points, um, specifically about things you can and can't control. And I know we might get to those challenges later. Um, but, you know, you come in from a loss and it's about how you carry yourself. It's about the words you use. It's about how you get people to think about the things they can control um, and how, again, just like the team, they're going to pick themselves back up and and continue on the path. Um, of what our goals and objectives are. Um, you know, I think empower is a really important word there. Um, it's my leadership style may not work for all of my reports, right? Or people who I mentor and they may say, okay, just like I've taken from you, Chris, things that work for my personality, things that work for my approach. So I want them to say, okay, what works for me? How do I develop my own style? How do I then help others um, you know, continue to lead and learn and, you know, not be afraid to fail, not be afraid to talk, not be afraid to um, just continue to grow. So I think that it's, you know, it does permeate everything, right? I don't think it's necessarily always conversations about leadership and conversations about it. it, it those are definitely appropriate at certain times, but it's more about how you conduct meetings, how you're inclusive, how you're um, you know, an idea might not be able to happen because of something like a budget or a, an approval process, but you should still have the conversation and it's a, just a way to be respectful and um, that continued building trust. So it, it comes through everything. It's not a, it's not a one moment, but it's that empowering, encouraging people to find those leaders in themselves. Great point. Okay. So Rayal, I'm going to go to you and we could, we could, everybody can pop in whenever they want, but Rayal, I'm going to challenge you to something Jess just said, and it is her style. I worked with her very closely for many, many years, and she's a true and great pro. But as she said, some of the things that I did maybe didn't match with her and, and, you know, whatever. So we, we accept those qualities that we could learn from people accordingly. So my question to you is this, because Jess said something very interesting. How often do you talk about leadership within your group? How often do, does the word mentor come up? Empower, listening, empathy. How often are those tangible words talked about in what is an intangible action to see them manifest themselves? Mm -hmm. I think quite often with my direct reports, because my direct reports all manage someone else themselves. And so they're kind of at the stage in their career, career when I was, when you brought me to the Jets, where a little bit of leadership experience, but a lot of room to grow, a lot of room to learn. Um, but I think what's key is not just focusing on those people who are already leaders, but flagging the people in your department who you see as future leaders. And, and one thing I'll say is I think with Chris's um, – tutoring anyone can become a leader but i also think it's important to acknowledge that some people in the creative space don't necessarily have those aspirations some people are truly more fulfilled just creating and there's nothing wrong with that um and and sometimes leadership can just be by example that like if you are dynamic creative someone underneath you learning your creative process is a form of leadership even if you're not a hands-on mentor type um and you know one thing i know Chris, you you preached a lot is, yes, you can have a general leadership style and philosophy, but the reality is you need to, you know, treat each one of your people differently because they respond to different things. Just like a football coach knows who needs tough love um, and who needs a sort of more gentle approach, you need to understand your people and, and what makes them go. Um, and I, I really like what Vit said about uh, lead versus manage right? And uh, people versus projects. And I think if if you asked a very corporate management philosophy person to critique my leadership, they'd probably argue that my reports don't fear me enough, you know? And 
I understand in certain spaces that might be a necessary dynamic. I personally don't su subscribe to that, especially in the creative space, because I think back to some of the best work I did was when I worked for Chris, because I wanted to go above and beyond for him to return the favor of the trust and empathy you showed me, right? It it allowed me to tap into a deeper motivation. And so likewise, when I look at these very talented creatives on my staff, I want to make them feel like they, that I trust their creative process and that I'm not micromanaging, right? Like no one wants to sit behind an editor and question exactly where they're making a cut. I want to wait till they export their V1. And then I could say, Hey, what do you think about tightening this up? And when they realize that that feedback is rooted in making the content better and not because I feel like being the boss and weighing in just to weigh in, that's the type of dynamic I think that leads to the best work. And so understanding that each one of your editors has a different process and knowing when to give them space versus when they might hit a little bit of a roadblock and need you to push them in a direction. I think that's that's how you get successful content out of the, the group. Nice. It, Chris, Rael, Rael hit on something that I think is, I, I, is like the secret sauce, right? And I think becoming a parent has even strengthened my approach even more to the fact that like you cannot lead every member of your team the same way. Um, I, you know, in my early years at the Raiders, we had different bosses, you and I, and everyone had a different style. And I and I noticed that there was a few that thought that it was just, you know, we were all sort of one family and everyone kind of was, should be treated the same. And I felt like sort of an outcast at times because I'm more of an emotional, like sensitive, you know, person. And I needed to be, I felt like I wanted to be treated a little differently. Um, and then having three kids of my own now, and knowing that as like a father, you you know, each one of them is so different and brings such a different personality to this world that like you cannot parent them each the same way. Um, and I have taken that over into my work life a lot. And I think it's it's huge. And Raul touched on that and really also dives into like being a coach and, and, and the players you have. And also I've learned a lot of, you know, we work in this forward facing business, right? Everything's critiqued. Everyone, everything's very subjective. Everyone has an opinion. And a lot of times I felt like there was too much when things went bad, we were, we were, you know, called out or if we made a mistake, our group, our teams were called out. And so I really try to take it upon myself to walk around each day and like bring like positive reinforcement. Who doesn't like positive reinforcement? You know, we had coaches growing up, we all played sports. Um, I, I found that too, too many times in some of my past places I've worked, there was there was too much of we only heard from leadership or management when mistakes were made and there wasn't enough praise to go around. So one of the other reasons of doing this discussion today is this. And that no one's no one's crying for us or bleeding for us coming being working in professional sports. It's a wonderful privilege. It's it's fantastic. It's it's you know, you. But here's the thing. There's a lot of hours, a lot of emotion to it because the wins and the losses and the ups and downs of being part of a professional sports franchise. But the hours are really, really long. But what I'm saying is this. With that comes stress. With that comes the, the, the pressures of content, the pressures of representing a franchise. And to Vitt's point, positivity, energy, and enthusiasm. So Jess, I'll, I'll go to you, please. The challenges that you would like to share with us and how you deal with those and you can take it any way you want. You can deal with the, you know, the hours and the, the demands and the pressures or however you see your challenges on a daily basis. Well, I think it goes to the last point of everyone's challenges are different, right? And everybody has competing priorities even within their own responsibilities. So just like engagement of fans is like a personalization experience. What do people want and how are we engaging them? We are doing that same thing as leaders in the, and fit to your point, on having a young child of my own, you know, how to lead him and help him grow and also figuring out himself, right? That what, what works for him. So I think that the challenges that, that I would outline are, are ones I've touched on. There is a lot out of your control and, and it's not, you know, there are other businesses where there are things that are very out of your control, but, uh, you know, this is a very emotionally charged and public facing, um, you know, 
thing that we're all doing. Um, and people care deeply about these teams, which we're very privileged that they do. Um, but obviously that creates emotions that you then are, are handling, um, you know, as teams. Um, and outside opinions, right? You know, especially um, in, in the social space, right? You you may think of an idea, you've worked on it, it came from a great place, you've thought of all the different ways it could be taken and and it either takes off in a super positive way or something went sideways that, you know, you, you couldn't control because of somebody else's, you know, opinion on it. And how do you manage through that? How do you learn from it? How do you... Um, not let it impact you negatively when you're when you want to turn it into a positive for the next time. Um, I'd say the other piece um, is work life balance. Uh, it's one that I think everybody, uh, especially post the COVID nineteen pandemic, um, it's really an evolution of how people want to live their lives and how um, you know having those conversations with your teams to say what's important to you. How can I get you? the capacity to shut down for a little bit, right? Like being on 24 seven is not good for productivity. Um, so mental health, how are we making sure that people are taking those time out to take care of themselves and, you know, um, make, you know, so that they come back stronger and better and, 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 you know, really ready to dive into what they're doing. And then I touched on in the beginning, those competing individual priorities, right? You, you not only you're outside of, uh, work life, but here you have a, you know, here is my kind of to-do list. And even within departments, right, there's everyone's to-do list is a little bit different. How are we making sure that we're taking that step back, reminding each other to respect that everyone's job is different, but that we together create the best product is important and you got to do it daily. It seems simple, but, you know, there's a lot of, you know, uh, Rael was talking about having 19 people, right? Those 19 people do very different things probably, but they all have to come together cohesively to put out the product that's the best product for the fans and the organization. So those would be my three kind of big points on the challenges. Rael, Jess just teed it up. You've got 19 people that look to you for leadership. You have equal stakeholders within the organization that you must communicate effectively with. And then you have senior leadership. How do you communicate effectively with everybody in an inclusive manner to make sure that priorities are united? Yeah, I think it was working with you and Jess where it really kind of clicked for me that those competing priorities exist and that that's not necessarily a product of a dysfunctional organization. That's a product of different marching orders, right? And so I'd like to give a, a fairly specific example, which is like we deal with our friends in the legal department quite a bit. Right. And there's some stuff that's pretty black and white. We don't use popular music because that could get us a massive fine. But there's a lot of stuff that's gray areas, whether it's, you know, the meme space is still a wild, wild west of rights issues. But more specifically, you know, I think about um, we do like an all access show a la Hard Knocks. And how do you deal with the fact that a coach might like a certain coffee brand, but our sponsor is a different coffee brand, you know, is the answer to blur everything is the answer to remove stuff. And I think that, you know, the people who are editing that show together, who are incredibly talented, creative people, their North star is always just storytelling. And what do the fans want to see? And if legal chimes in and says, Hey, this is a bit problematic for us they're inclined to kind of see red and just how could they not understand this is so important from a storytelling perspective. And I think that while I never want to train someone out of being passionate about good storytelling, it's important to get them to take a step back and put a legal hat on for a second and say, Hey, listen, they're not, their job is not to make your life miserable. They're not doing this for fun. They're doing this because their job is to protect this company from financial risk. And that is a valid job description. And, you know, for all the progress we've made as a department earning trust, whether it's within legal, whether it's within football ops, if we're responsible for a piece of content that leads to a fine for the organization, our leash is going to get a lot shorter. And so getting them to see that bigger picture that like, just like it's important for you to have trust within the creative group, it's also important that my counterpart in legal trust me to know where it's black and white and where it's gray and when it's gray to come to her and her team so that we can have a discussion. And she will understand that sometimes in the name of good content, we need to be a little more flexible. 
just like my people need to understand that there are times that there's no flexibility because we will be held liable. And so that's the type of dynamic I think you deal with, whether it's, you know, someone in sponsorship trying to, you know, get a make good for a partner, whether it's someone in PR, you know, having to think a little more paranoid than we might because they have to be mindful of what reporters might say. And so it really does come down, down to like, you know, take a walk in another person's shoes. If you understand their role and their priorities, I think it allows you to have a a perspective that will foster more camaraderie, better morale, and just just a better understanding of, you know, that while this is a fun job and it's sports, it's still a business and we need to learn that side of it to be the best people at our jobs. That you said something that I want to revisit, but I also want you your uh, three challenges or something that is challenging that you could share with us to be, again, in the mindset of a servant leader. You said about being a continuous learner and constantly, you said podcasts or reading. If you're in a leadership position, you need to be a continuous learner because as Jess said, and she really underscored it earlier, is you have to adapt. Like how is society and culture how are people responding to feedback, you know, difficult conversations and what is, you know, the evolution of an employee and how do we take care of people anyway? So talk to talk to us on the on the, yeah. you know, the theme yeah. here that Jess and Rael have shared, please. I think it's interesting that we all have similar like we're obviously, you know, cut from the Gargano tree. So we all have similar experiences and we all have. But like everything they're saying is like in my notes of stuff I wanted to say, which is very interesting, right? But I think Real just touched on one thing, and I always joke about like my internal checklist, right? Especially like at the Raiders, it was like, you know, Al Davis, like, what is he going to say about this content? What is the president going to think? What is the general manager going to think? What is the head coach going to think? And you really have to go through all those levels and be prepared to like give them your why. Um, I always felt like at the end of the day, I wanted to do what was best for the organization. And if I could, if I could explain that to all those different entities, because they're not always on the same page. And at the end of the day, yes, he's the owner of the team. And sometimes you're going to have to do things that the owner wants that you may or may not believe in. And it's a challenge at times. But um, I think that internal checklist was always like a challenge for me. And it kept me up at night and it was stressful because you also then have to pick like, okay, I know the head coach might not like this, but I know this is what the owner likes but I have to work with the head coach on a daily basis. So it all goes down to building those relationships and building that trust and that I can face the head coach and I can explain to him why I had to do this without throwing ownership, general manager, Chris Gargano under the bus. Um, I think some of the challenges that are more unique to me and that have evolved over the last couple of years have to do with, um, you know, young staff and their personal brand and maybe their success on social media to the detriment of, you know, the logo and forgetting about like where we work. And I think I've talked about this before. There, there's people at a lot of these organizations, especially the Jets, the Raiders, the, the A's that have been here 30 plus years, right? That, that don't care how many Emmys you have on your shelf, that don't care how, about how many likes you have on social media. And I really, really try to coach these young guys up and like, you know, um, if you walk into this building and you act like, you know, you don't care about any of these people or what they've suffered through, like you will not be here very long. And that's just the reality. You can listen to me or not. Um, I, I want you to be successful in this space. I want you to be successful here. And there's a lot of opportunity. But if you don't come in with a little humility, um, you know, you, you won't last long. And then thirdly, I think um, I talk about athletes not needing us as much anymore. And I'm sure on the NFL side, you guys deal with this more than I do currently, but there was a time when, you know, Chris and I were doing our thing at the Raiders and I would make DVDs for these players and I would give it to them in their lockers. And they were so excited to have like videos of themselves and highlight reels. And, and to be honest now, they don't, they don't need us. You know, they have these personal platforms, they have these staffs of their own. Um, and I think that's an ultimate challenge, like moving forward for all of us. Okay, Jess, I got something for you. And Vic, awesome. So in the last year, I've met all these interesting people, not just in sports, but authors and people that CEOs and presidents in other industries. And one gentleman that I've met who has a doctorate in leadership and has worked in the military, an amazing individual, Dr. Andrew Campbell, he's written books. And he said this quote, Jess, 
And I could safely say, I know we're flattering one another here. I Listen, I teed it up by saying we're all friends and we're transparent about it. And I appreciate these relationships more than you know. And I'm just being open about it. That's it. So Jess, I will say this. It's, this is something you're very good at. And I'm going to say it this way. It, Dr. Andrew Campbell's quote is this. The relationship is more important than the problem. And if you just let that sink in, if you look at somebody, Grail, you were talking about like, oh, I got to go to legal. I got to get this. I got to go over here to marketing or PR or whatever. And you look at that person and you have that philosophy. This relationship is more important than what we're talking about. Personally, I was enlightened. I love that. Jess, I'm going to throw it to you with regard to have, when we have to have difficult conversations, if that is in, you know, if you embody that, it sure makes it a lot easier. Yeah, and it really comes back to the trust, right? You've built this long, this relationship with someone. So if you if you need to have a difficult conversation, you hope that they trust that this is why, right? Like they know that you've come to them because either you're faced with a challenge you weren't expecting, um, whether that's on a project or with a person. Um, and it's really just trying to handle these things transparently and head on. Um, I think it's you know, just the most effective way to tackle something, obviously making sure that you have all of the right information, that you've seen someone else's perspective, um, that you've considered it, um, but really not letting things fester. You know, generally speaking, uh, we're big brands, small companies. So you're going to work with a lot of people on a daily basis, um, <laughs> you know, but pretty much, you know, all year round. So I think that um, it's really you know, I think, and I, I don't have the source on this piece of wisdom um, that I, my sister said to me one day, but if it's not going to matter in five years, don't give it more than five minutes. Okay. Some things are definitely getting more than five minutes, but making sure that that, to your point, it's really, it's rooted in the relationship, being able to help you navigate whatever the situation is, because it's probably going to be okay. Right. And you're going to have to figure out how to navigate through the difficult conversation, the preparation, the actual having of it, and whatever that outcome is. Okay, so Rael or Vit, either one of you take this. I've seen both of you in action, so I have um, some advanced knowledge in this. But walking down the hall, Vit, I'm going to go to you. I'm going to change it up here a little bit. You're going to be in the two slot now in the lineup. You walk down the hall, you know you have to deliver some information. How did how did you and how do you go about how what's been your evolution in that process of having a difficult conversation with somebody? That's a tough one. I think in my early days, I probably would have um, either figured out a way not to have that conversation, to be honest, or uh, I would have held back a little bit. But I think most of us in this position have been successful because especially with our direct reports, like we have that level of transparency. And I think like you always shared that with me. And again, it goes back to the word trust. Like you knew that there were things that stayed between us um, that to the betterment of the team, like you don't have to share everything with coordinators or that level of entry level. But I guess, you know, I just, I go in and think like, how would I want to be treated if I were in this position to have this conversation with? And that's, you know, and I always appreciated the transparency, no matter what, whether it was good, bad, or, um, and so I try to just have a conversation that when I get home at night, I can look in the mirror and be proud of the way I handled it. It might not always have the right outcome, but at the end of the day, like we, we have to like, you know, answer to ourselves um, first and foremost as a, you know, I not to be cheesy, but as a father, as a husband. Um, so I think it goes back to the word authenticity going, walking into that room to have that difficult conversation, but being authentic about it. You know, if I, if it makes me emotional and it brings me to the tears, like, so be it. Like, that's who I am as a person and as a leader. Nicely said, Vit. Nicely said. Rael, I've seen you in action, difficult conversations. But can I just, let me, Rael, before I go mm -hmm. to you, let me just say this. So as I've gotten into the consulting and coaching space, I've done deep dives on this topic. And I've come away with the following philosophy, which is this. If you're spending time with people and you're connecting with them on a regular basis, as you all have articulated beautifully here today, a difficult conversation is just another conversation. So as I got more advanced in my leadership journey, I, you know, people would say, man, you're so nice or, hey, you're kind, you know, where the heck are you going to start yelling or whatever? I never thought about it that way. I thought about it. 
I trust this person. Hopefully they trust me. We talked at the coffee shop about the Yankees win last night. And then at 10 o'clock, we had a meeting on another su subject. And then at three o'clock, we have a more serious one-on-one. -on -one. Well, it's not as if those two moments earlier didn't take place. It's still me. To your point, Vit, I'm still me. I'm going home tonight to be with my family, me. I got to look in the mirror. So I'm not going to all of a sudden become someone else. Yeah. I'm just going to tell you, this is going to be a harder conversation, buddy. Here we go. And then whatever that may be. Rayal, I know this is a topic that you're passionate about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I like what Vid said about, you know, having to prepare your why in certain conversations, right? And I think one of the unique challenges of overseeing, you know, social, which I think we all do, is everybody wants a piece, right? Anyone who is doing anything in the organization needs at least social promotion, if not event coverage. Um, and it's, it really is a gift and a curse because, you know, social is the biggest mouthpiece in this modern media landscape. On the other hand, it's difficult to tell someone, Hey, this, this event that you've poured your sweat and tears into is going to bomb on social. Um, and I think when when you first brought me on in the Jets, I probably did not have the most diplomatic approach when telling someone th that's not good social strategy. And so, you know, getting just like I tell my team to walk in someone else's shoes if we're getting pushed back from legal, sometimes I need to help my peer walk in my shoes, which is, hey, I have to meet with senior leadership to explain our engagement rate. And I'm measured against 31 other clubs who are really good at this. They have the the same challenges I do as far as needing to support these other groups. But, you know, we can't put out dud posts because it will ding us long term. This is how these algorithms work, right? And so, you know, we dealt with this at the Jets where at the end of every season, we would do an audit. Okay, what are our top performing posts? What are our lowest performing posts? And it's like, it usually wasn't rocket science. Top performing posts are going to be the best highlights. Lowest performing posts are going to be events we cover in the community. The answer is not don't cover events in the community. The answer is find a way to support your friends and community relations with a new approach to event coverage, right? So, you know, I, I know that not every post is going to go viral. And I know that our efforts in the community are an important thing for our fans to see. But how about instead of a still photo and some uninspiring copy to go with it, we give our player who's attending the event a GoPro and say, vlog this, and then the video editors put it together. That is a more, to, to Jess's original point about engaging and entertaining, you can get engaging and entertaining off the football field. It just requires a little more creative thought. And so I think, you know, when when a colleague comes to me with an idea for coverage that I know won't work, the answer is not no. The answer is, hey, what do you think about trying it this way? And I think as long as my peers understand that, like, you know, I think unfortunately the perception around a lot of social teams is that we're like no people, right? If you ask the average person, how do you like your social team at your work? They're like, oh, they're such a pain. You know, they act so holier than thou. And I tell my team, we we never can be that sanctimonious social team. We need to meet with our colleagues, understand their goals and find a way to support them that doesn't hurt us in the process. Because that answer does exist. Again, it just takes a little more work than a photo and some uninspiring copy. Like you, I think uh, a former jet once said, uh, we're only as good as our worst piece of content, right? And so the easy approach is, this is something we know isn't gonna go viral, mail it in. If anything, those posts you're inclined to mail it in are the ones that you should apply the most thought to because that's how you get them out of that sort of bottom performing post through through an approach like that. Good insight. Uh uh, Chris, that's definitely, Rael just hit on a big criticism for me that I, you taught me early on is that I think I, I was young and cocky in some areas and I would always like fight you on certain things and say, no, that's a terrible idea or whatever. But, and you gave me that latitude, but I think one thing I always try to remember that you preached is have an idea, like, don't just be a no person, give me like the alternative approach like you can't just be negative to be negative. Like come with an idea 
don't just be a no person. I take, I, I use that every single day. Thank you, Vit, for the kind words. I appreciate it. And that's so important though. Be solution based. You don't have to be right. Just come with an idea. Get us, move us forward. Right. Remember Jess at the Jets on my little whiteboard, I would have 95% problem or what was it? 5% problem, 95% solution. And just come with ideas. We don't have to be right. Be a, don't be afraid to fail. Let's just throw stuff out there. All right. We have two more topics and then we're going to call it a day. They are, and this is where the little bell goes off. What do you look for in an ideal candidate to hire at the commanders, the athletics and the New York Jets? And then we're going to conclude with your number one takeaway, piece of advice or takeaway in general that you would like to leave our audience today. All right, here we go. Bit, I'm going back to you. You hire, you've done a ton of hiring. What do you look for in somebody that's sitting across from you that you would like to bring them on, either to the Las Vegas Oakland Raiders or the Oakland Athletics? Yeah, I will say my opinion is like hiring, probably the most difficult part of the job at every level that I've done it. Um, I consider myself a people person. I, I try to like dive deeper into that and just what's on a resume or on a reel. Like there's a lot of talented people out there that make a lot of great content um, or great marketers. But to me, like you're putting together a team, right? So you have to know like your personal weaknesses. I try to hire people that will make me smarter, make the team smarter. Um, people that care have to outnumber the people that don't care on your team. Not everyone's going to care the same. But as long as the people like in my locker room outnumber the, the, the people that care outnumber the people that don't care, like we're going to be okay. Um, I think I look for qualities such as like competitiveness um, and really just the willingness to show up. Like, I, yes, people, right? Like, you know, hey, can you cover that event on Saturday? You know, if you're the person that's always saying no, then there's going to be problems, I think, like moving forward. Um, you know, collaborative. Um, I, I tend to go off the rails during interviews where I ask the more personal questions like, you know, what do you like to do when you're not watching sports or consuming content? Um, I often, you know, find it frustrating when people say like, I just want to work in sports or I just want to work in baseball. Um, you know, there's got to be something beyond that that you're passionate about that you bring to the table. Um, I think the other thing I, one of my secret questions in the interview process is like, you know, when you get this job, who's the first person you're going to call and tell about it? Uh, I think I like to kind of learn like how people like grew up. What what was the environment? What were you, what was your family life like? I I don't know. Those to me are all insights into what kind of person I'm getting, and then who I'm gonna you know who could potentially be a challenge moving forward. And, and at the end of the day, if you have equal you know if people bring equal strengths to the table, I'll more, more often than not pick the person I think can be, um, can be like a better fit for the team and that can evolve into like what's going to work better for our organization. Nice. Jess. You'll know the bit did not say one technical skill, which I completely agree with. I think one in our line of work, a lot can be taught, right? Of course, it's great if you come with some experience, um, especially for, you know, things that um, require shooting, editing, things of that nature. Even that said, I think that someone's uh, soft skills are are going outweigh those because um, also those those hard skills evolve over time, right? And it, our businesses changes, you know, day by day. Um, I think what's really important and I would say is a, maybe a bit of a tweak on the fit for the team. I think it's really important to make sure that you are getting a... Uh, your, your team makeup is diverse in thought so that those perspectives are not, don't become one note. And I think it is really important to say like, because you do want to almost create not conflict, but you want to create a situation where it's not like, yes, this is a great idea because all these people kind of have the same uh, POV and have the same favorite platform and have the same um, background. So thinking about how that team fits together and our good teammates and our problem solvers and strategic thinkers, but also come from that different place so that they um, potentially push the envelope and have the team uh, think in a different way, I think goes what I would add. But I think everything that said uh, was spot on. Your first point was tremendous in that we didn't talk about skills because the people that get the interview, we already know your skills. We've seen your resume. 
Now, who are you? What do you care about? How passionate are you? How kind are you? So anyway, go ahead. And the phone call uh, question is a good one. I'm going to write that down after. I know. (laughs) I I like that one too. I'm stealing that. That's good. Um. It's great to be able to piggyback on on two people who uh, are experts in the space, right? Because they they hit on everything. Um, I think Jess nailed it on the diversity of thought, right? That like, it, there's often a tendency to like, oh, this person doesn't have sports experience, stay away. Like we, we're almost cultish if we're in sports. Like you have to, you know, earn your stripes. When the reality is it's more important to me that someone understands content than they know the 53 man roster or what constitutes a catch in the NFL. Right. So I want to make sure I have some true football savants because there's times when we need to know X's and O's for the sake of content. There's other times when I want to pull someone who comes from like politics news environment because they might have a different approach to content. Right. I think the, the curse of the sports industry is like, we're a a bit in a vacuum echo chamber. Like I, I spend way too much time consuming what 31 other NFL teams are doing and not enough time looking at what complex and vice are doing. Um, and so that's one question I ask is I like to challenge people like, Hey, if you're interviewing for a social job, who is best in social outside of sports, right? Like, you know, back in my day, it was like Wendy's. Well, who is the Wendy's of right now really pushing that envelope? Is it Duolingo? Is it TSA? Right? Like how someone answers that question tells them, a, tells you a lot about their content consumption, their taste, which will inform their strategy. Um, I think it's easier said than done, but it's like, realistically, you're looking for an intelligent person and an emotionally intelligent person. And I don't think one outweighs the other. Um, And we've talked a lot about sort of like the challenges you'll face and, you know, being solution versus problem. Well, how do you make sure someone is solutions oriented? Because if they're not, that's going to bring down a whole team. And so coming up with very real hypotheticals, like to piggyback on what I said in the, the last response, okay, we have a challenge in that we need to cover our community relations events. We know those posts underperform. How would you cover those events? And like, I'm hesitant to put people on the spot too much because I think that can be unfair. But I also think seeing how someone responds to a challenging question in real time tells you a lot about them. I don't need the perfectly baked answer, but I also don't want to see someone panic because this job can be high pressure. But, you know, as also as far as work life balance, it's like it's a high pressure job, but this also isn't we're not curing cancer right? We're, we're not going to space. And so making sure someone has that right balance of like super passionate, but also understands that like this can be fun and it's okay to take a step back. Um, I, I just, I'm kind of looking for that and it's, it's really tough in 30 minutes to, to get that out of someone. Um, but I also think that like, if you ask the right questions and I think mo- most importantly, like take a step back and allow, I want to know what questions they have right? The questions they ask me will tell them a lot. Is it how many free tickets do we get? Or is it, you know, what's your content strategy? Um, and so I, uh, I can't say there's like a blueprint when I go into an interview in a lot of ways, I kind of want the candidate to steer the direction of the interview because that that's what I'm going to learn most from, right? Just like when I've spoke to your classes, I much prefer the the portion where the class asks me questions because I can learn so much about my entire space, my entire audience from what they're asking me. It's like a, it's like a free focus group. Um, so I, I think if you go into an interview, understanding that you can learn, even if you don't end up hiring the candidate, you can learn something that informs your content strategy just through these conversations. Here's a tip. Don't ask, do I get to travel with the team on away games in your interview? And don't ask if I get to hang out with Charles Woodson. Don't chew gum. <laughs> no, and Braille, you you alluded to my NYU class where you have spoken. Vit, you're next on the dock, and I'm going to sign you up here in a minute. But that's I hope we'll get to that. But Braille, you're right. Each and every week, amongst my NYU students, they give me a fresh perspective of how they are engaging with interviews. We talk about it every single week, and one of the things that I want them to leave is ex- leave every class with because we do address it is be curious. Be curious, invest in the person you're interviewing with, know them, know their business, but then listen, be present within the framework of the time that you have, whether it's 28 minutes, 58, be curious. So that's a great point, Rail, and thank you. 
All right, here we go. Last item. Your number one takeaway that you want to leave somebody with here today that has impacted you, you can share with the group. Jessica, you go first. Um, I, I think we've talked a lot about some really important topics. I think what's interesting is kind of those common threads um, about leadership and leadership in sports specifically. Um, it's hard work, right? And it's a living, breathing thing. It's not set it and forget it. Here's my philosophy, um, you know, and I'm going to like, if people don't work with that, it's it's not going to continue to work for me. So I think that it's, you're learning as much, you're imparting as much wisdom as you're learning from those that you, that you are trying to lead. Um, it's about having um, the perspective to know that self-reflection is a huge part of it, right? And if you're continuing to say, am I evolving? You're hopefully setting that example for your team to continue to evolve. And, you know, then from that, that you're able to put the best product out, no matter what those challenges are, right? Our challenges are going to change on a daily basis. They're going to change over time. Um, they're going to change as our team changes, team, our direct teams and team, our sports teams, right? So it's, it's that flexibility. It's the willingness to adapt. Um, and, you know, being able to go home, look yourself in the mirror and say, I, I did my best today. And yeah, it definitely wasn't perfect, but I'm gonna go try and be my best tomorrow. So you take that positive mindset and keep that evolution of your leadership um, moving. Vittorio. I, I just wrote down like authenticity. I think that's a word we all used. Like, you know, um, be yourself. You're not going to be perfect every time. You're not going to say the right things every time, but just be true to yourself and, you know, and take a little bit from what mentors or bosses that you felt like you thrived under and, and use those to like start your basis for how you want to be as a leader um, and then just think about not treating everyone the exact same way. Like we all kind of spoke to as well. And, and, and that would be my advice. And look, at the end of the day, I think I've had to have some tough conversations with myself that maybe my leadership style just isn't right for this organization. We all want these jobs to work so bad and none of us are, you know, you, I'm not, I don't consider myself a quitter. Um, but I've had to walk away from situations where I just knew that who I was and my personality and what I bring to the table might not be a good fit for this organization. And so um, don't be afraid to just be authentic. Nice. Real. Um, what they said, first of all. Um, but I think for me, I'm really um, – inspired to push a pay it forward message, right? That I, I first talked about Chris taking the time out of his bu busy schedule for me when, uh, you know, I was a nobody. And I know we said we wouldn't embarrass Chris too much, but like I owe a lot of my success to Chris giving me an opportunity, right? Um, and this is a very small industry. And so I've made a lot of hires based on not necessarily someone I know directly, but someone I know and trust vouching for someone else and making an intro. And so I think, A, it's really important to build a network of really good people. And it might not even be to land the next job. It might be because you need someone as a sounding board. Um, but I also think it's important to just really take the time that sometimes there's a, a bad habit, at, you know, amongst executives of, you know, my, my, calendar is seven hours of meetings. And then I got to go home and catch up on the inbox. I don't have time for a lunch and learn with a college student. Um, but the reality is th spending that time is worth it. A, because you can learn something like we've been talking about, but B, because you kind of owe it, right? Like we all, we all got that break or, or had that mentor step up. Um, and there's something really satisfying about, seeing someone you put time and effort into reach potential. Uh, and a conversation I had with a, my boss recently is kind of the, the challenge of like, if I have a task, sometimes it might be easier to just get it done myself, right? That that's in the near term, that is the, the easiest path forward. Long-term, the best thing is to teach someone on my staff 
how to take that task off my plate so I can go to my boss and help them more while also training up this person on my team to, you know, step up into the the next great role. And so I think that's really important is that like, it, sometimes we're moving a mile a minute and the tendency is to be a lone wolf. Um, but, you know, us creatives were, I think we're more of a wolf pack and, you know, have learning when you need to lean on your people and when they can lean on you and, and creating that balanced dynamic where it's a true symbiotic working relationship. Um, that's when I've been the most creatively fulfilled um, and also fulfilled as a leader in seeing people step up into leadership roles themselves. Amen. All right. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Nicely done. No, nicely done by all three of you. Here's what I would say to close. And I this went by so quickly and there was so much wisdom shared. I will say this. It is evident that you're not only all three of you great leaders, you're students of leadership. And that Vit said it clearly. You all said it in some way, shape or form. Jessica phrased it in self-reflection, introspection. How am I doing today? Your leader, you're a different leader than on Tuesday then you will be on Thursday. And it's that constant evolution and adapting and learning that you all articulated throughout our time here together. So not only are you good leaders, you're students of leadership, and you look at it in a totality, a big picture. And I talk about this because I'm older than all of you considerably, which is this, is what is your leadership legacy, right? At the end of the day, Vit, when you left the Raiders, you had a legacy there. Now you're establishing a new one at the A's, the athletics, and then you have one in totality. Jessica has one at the at the Jets. And Rael, you have one at the places where you've been. And how important is that to you? When people say, hey, Rael and team. And then what comes out of people's mouths, right? He cared about me. He mentored me. He taught me. He, he understood. He took pride in his own leadership, which had me taking pride in what I was doing. So I just want to thank all of you. And I thank Rael. Vittorio, and Jessica for sharing their wisdom with us today. I have two takeaways. One, you lead the whole person. You heard all three of them emphasize that you're not just leading the cinematographer, the social media producer, or the editor. You're leading everything about them, not just what they do, but the whole person. And it is your job as a leader to understand those people. What they talked about are universal leadership principles. That's what I appreciated so much about the discussion. And then finally, to that point, all three of them are continuous learners. They don't just show up and say, hey, I'm the leader, let's do this. They work to get better as leaders. They study. You heard Vittorio, podcasts, reading, whatever it is for them, they're working to constantly understand themselves better so they could show up in the best way possible for their people. I truly appreciate that. And again, those are universal principles, not just leadership and content in professional sports. I hope you enjoyed the conversation very much. Thank you very much for being part of Keep the Line Moving. We'll see you next week. Every week you hear guests on this podcast talk about some of their biggest leadership challenges. As a leader, you want to make an impact on those you lead and reach your organization's goals while also optimizing your time management. Wherever you are in your leadership journey, we could all use some help. This is what we focus on with our group and individual coaching services. To book a call or get more information, email me directly at chrisg at garganoleadership.com or visit our website at garganoleadership.com. For our podcast and video producer, Jack Radutsky, and our marketing coordinator, Savin Narwhal, have a great week, everybody.